a great honor once again to be a part of the Vayichan program, and I thank Rabbi Tarragon and all of the staff for putting together this incredible program. As we all know, we've had a program that was a few months back, right before Shavuos. Then there was the amazing Mishmar program, and now we have this beautiful program that will help us try to navigate these times of Bein HaMetzarim, these times, and give us a little bit of a perspective of how important Abbas Yisrael actually is. So that's what I'd like to focus on today. And I thank all of you for taking the time to join us because there is nothing more important for us to be focusing on now than on these issues that are so relevant to the time that we are now in and to the experience that we all have as a Jewish people. What we're going to focus on today in our shir is the Mishnah in Pirkei Avos. And it's important whenever we learn Pirkei Avos that we make sure to focus on who it is that was the author of the Mishnah, or the saying, the teaching, the instruction that we might be given in any given Mishnah. There's something to those lessons, and there's a reason why that particular personality, why that Tana chose to, get, to impart those individual lessons and ideas to all of us. So the Mishnah says in Pirkei Avos, Hillel Omer, Hillel teaches all of us, Hevei mitalmidav shel Aaron, we should make a concerted effort to count ourselves among the Talmidim of Aaron, and that means to be an Ohev Shalom, Virodev Shalom. Just as we know, Aaron HaKohen was always Rodev Shalom. He was looking for peace. He was always looking for a sense of equanimity and calm in the generation, in the community. Ohev Esabrios, then the Mishnah says, we should love other people, Umekarvan La Torah. So let's just first back up a little bit and understand why is it that Hillel HaZaken shows to say this statement, Hillel Omer. And my father often says in the name of Rav Salavechik that the Mishnah here often says, Hillel Omer, or Hu Haya Omer, he would say. I'm sure there were many things that Hillel spoke about. I'm sure there were many great lessons that Hillel gave over to his Talmidim and to his generation. So what does the Mishnah in Pirkei Avos mean when it says that a particular Tana used to say? What do you mean he used to say? There were many things that he said. And Rav Soloveitchik suggested what it means is, not that Hillel used to instruct, but rather that Hillel's whole essence was this. Hillel Omer, the personality of Hillel, when you got to know him, exemplified these characteristics. This is what he was all about. This was his mahus. This was his being. This was his soul. This is what his life represented. And therefore, it's important to understand a little bit of the context of Hillel and to then appreciate why it is that the Mishnah came to the conclusion that Hillel, in fact, lived these principles. This is what Hillel was. So we have a fascinating Gemara in Masech Shabbos, where the Gemara recounts three different stories. All three of them seem pretty similar to each other, but each one of them has its own unique experience in which Hillel interacted with a potential convert. So story number one, the Gemara tells us, as we know, that Hillel and Shammai lived at the same time. And Hillel and Shammai were contemporaries. They had many, many great disputes, many, many great differences in halacha, in which they argued very fiercely. And yet the Gemara says, as much as they disagreed with each other, the Gemara tells us that ha-emes ve-ha-shalom ehavu. We know that Hillel and Shammai loved each other to the point that even though they disagreed so much, it says that they made sure that their children married into each other. They made sure that their communities were blended and mixed. And as much as they had halachic differences, they never allowed that to get in the way of their relationship with one another or with the community as a whole. That was Hillel and that was Shammai. And yet, Hillel and Shammai had two very different personalities. So the Gemara here tells us that there was a potential convert who came one day to Shammai and he asked him that he'd like to become a convert. So Shammai engaged him in conversation. And he then goes on to ask Shammai, how many Torahs are there? And Shammai says, there are two. There's a Torah Shebech Sav, and there's the component of Torah Shebaal Peh. Well, the convert, the soon-to-be convert, turns to Shammai and he says, you know, I don't really understand what this Torah Shebaal Peh is all about. How can it be? If you're going to tell me that God gave us a Torah, if you're going to ask me that I should abide by all the laws that are divine, then I understand and I can accept. But if you're now going to tell me that the rabbis in each generation are going to augment and they're going to make up their own rules and make a Torah Shabal Peh, 
This convert said, I'm not prepared to accept that. And Shammai says, well, if you're not prepared to accept that, I would appreciate if we don't have this conversation again. And Shammai turns him away. The Gemara says he goes down the block to Hillel's home, and he asks Hillel, how many Torahs are there? And Hillel says, there are two. There's Torah Shabbat Sav, and there is Torah Shabbat Peh, to which the soon-to-be convert says, well, I'm only interested in accepting Torah Shabbat Sav. Torah Shabbat Peh doesn't really make sense to me. I will not accept that. And Hillel says, you're not scaring me. No problem. Hillel continues to engage him in conversation. And Hillel says, let us talk. Let us see what we can do. The soon-to-be convert comes to the first class, and Hillel says, okay, let's teach you the Aleph base. Aleph makes this sound, Bays makes that sound, Gimel makes that sound, Dalit makes this, and the convert is listening, taking notes. He's, he's really paying attention. He's very diligent because he's very interested in becoming a convert. The very next day, he comes to the second class in Hillel's home, and Hillel says, well, Aleph makes a D, D, D sound, and Gimel makes an Aleph sound, and he mixed them up, and he did everything backward, and the convert says to him, I seem to remember that yesterday we had our first lesson in Judaism, and you taught me the letters of Aleph, Beis, Gimel, Dalid, and it was different than what you taught me today. And Hillel says, that is correct, and that is exactly why we need Torah Shabal Peh. You can have everything written, you can have Aleph, Beis, Gimel, Dalid, but unless you have a tradition, unless you have somebody who is going to teach you how to interpret all of those letters, how to really understand what those letters represent, then Torah Shabbat Sav is meaningless. And it is with that patience, it is with that sensitivity, it is with that sense of caring that Hillel was able to inspire and motivate this convert to then become encouraged to live out his dream. And that was the sensitivity of Hillel. The Gemara then goes on to say another story that a convert once came in to Shammai, and he said to Shammai, Gaireni, I would like you to convert me as long as you can teach me all of Torah al regal achas. He was almost making fun of Shammai, and he said, teach me everything there is to know while standing on one foot. And Shammai said, you don't understand the vast, the vast body of knowledge that Torah represents. I cannot teach you everything in one session. And Shammai turns him away. He goes down the block to Hillel, and he asks Hillel, can you teach me everything al regal achas? And Hillel says, yes. If you want to know the essentials, if you want to know the fundamental, all that Torah is, that is that which you would not want done to you, you should never do to somebody else. And Hillel said with that, he was able to inspire this person. He influenced him to become a convert. And there, once again, you see the incredible indulgence, the patience of Hillel, the understanding that he had of people. The Gemara then goes on to say a third story also equally as inspiring, where we're told that Hillel was confronted by a convert, and Shammai was confronted by the very same. And this soon-to-be convert comes to Shammai and says, you know, I was passing by the children's cheder the other day, and I heard that they were learning the psukim and chumash, and there it talks about the beautiful, the beautiful garments that are worn by somebody in the Jewish people. It sits a me'il, an ephod, that they have golden plates on them, and such a beautiful tapestry to make this clothing come together. And Hillel says, and this soon-to-be convert turns to Shammai and he says, you know, I'd like to become a Jew, but only if I can wear those beautiful garments. And Shammai turns to him and he says, I guess you don't understand. Those are only reserved for the Kohen Gadol. You cannot come into this community and think that you have the right to wear the clothing that are reserved for the holiest, for the most sacred and divine human being. I'm sorry, that is not going to be an option for you. To which he then turns to Hillel and he says, Hillel, I'd like you to allow me to convert as long as I will have the opportunity to wear the clothing that are designated for the Kohen Gadol. And Hillel says, listen, once we're talking about the Kohen Gadol, don't you know that we're told, Hazar HaKarev Yumas? Don't we know that we're told that if somebody comes into a place in the Beis Hamikdash where they do not belong, they are destined to have the death penalty. They will be killed. So therefore, Hillel explains to him, and with tremendous patience, Hillel goes through the whole discussion, and he says, listen, you could be the greatest human being, you could be David HaMelech, the king of the Jewish people. But still, those clothing are designated for the Kohen Gadol, and for the Kohen Gadol only. And therefore, he says, this is not something that is a possibility for you. And with that patience, and with that understanding, Hillel once again was able to motivate a convert to the point that the Gemara says these three converts got together one day and they all shared their experiences. And the conclusion was, 
Look what a gentleman Hillel Hazaken was. Look how understanding he was of people. Look how much patience he had when somebody was coming to him so disrespectfully. And yet Hillel took it in stride. Hillel was able to be understanding. And therefore it is no coincidence that Hillel is the one in our Mishnah who says, Hevemi Talmidav Shal Aaron. Ohev Shalom, Virodev Shalom, Ohev Esabrios Umekarvan La Torah. You cannot have patience for other people to the extent that Hillel did unless you really love them. And if you don't love them, you will never be able to have that sense of understanding. You will never have that time to give over to people and to invest in their well-being. And Hillel did that. And in the end, because of his Ohev Esabrios, because he loved people so much, he was able to be Mekarvan La Torah. He was able to bring them ultimately to a sense of understanding and appreciation of what Torah is all about. And that is the great life and legacy of Hillel Hazakin. So we turn to that Mishnah in Pirkei Avos, and we look at the commentary of the Maharal. And the Maharal writes the very same comment, not only on this Mishnah, but also on a previous Mishnah, have a done as kal adam lekaf zechus. And the Maharal makes the same point in each place, and that is, why is it that we encourage people to go to the extreme in this idea of avas Yisrael, of avas habrios? Why do we have to go to the extreme in order to love and show appreciation for other people? Well, says the Maharal, the reason why is because this is really an extension of the mitzvah of Ahavas Hashem. Writes the Maharal, if you love HaKadosh Baruch Hu, then obviously you love his children. So take, for example, for those who are married, I'll give a personal example. I got married 10 years ago. My wife is a graphic designer. When we got married, I knew nothing about graphic design and I had absolutely no appreciation for it either. However, as you come to love a person more and more, you love everything that is attached to that person as well. Well, if we believe that everybody in this world is created with Selem Elohim, and that is really what the Mishnah says, Jew and non-Jew alike, we are told that everyone was created B'Tselem Elohim, everyone has a piece of HaKadosh Baruch Hu inside of them, well then if you love HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you have to love everything that is connected to him. It means you have to have a sense of Ava Sabrios, and therefore writes the Maharal, why are we instructed to love other people? Because we have a mitzvah of Ahava Hashem, Ve'ahavta Hashem Elokecha B'chalavavcha, and by extension, if we are to love HaKadosh Baruch Hu, we obviously also need to love all of his children. We need to love all of his creations. That's an extension of who he is, of what he represents, and says the Maharal. This is why we also have the very difficult instruction of have a done as kal ha'adam lekaf zechus. We have an obligation to go to the extreme and to judge others favorably because they are part of what HaKadosh Baruch Hu is. And if we respect the Ribbon Shalolam, if we appreciate what HaKadosh Baruch Hu is all about, then we need to also appreciate and respect and give the time and dignity to all of his creations as well. There's a Pasuk in Sefer Yeshaya that describes Avraham Avinu in very glowing terms. And the Navi Yeshaya writes that Avraham Avinu is the most beloved. Avraham Avinu is the cherished child of, Avram, of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. He is the most admired. He is the most loved. Why is that? Because he's called Zera Avraham Ohavi. Avraham Avinu is considered the beloved of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And you ask yourself why? There are so many Jews throughout the ages that HaKadosh Baruch Hu could have loved. And yet Avraham Avinu is given this divine appellation of Zera Avraham Ohavi. He is the one that HaKadosh Baruch Hu absolutely loves. And the question is, why? The Chassam Sofer touches on this issue. And the Chassam Sofer writes, that it's not because Avraham Avinu was the first one to recognize godliness in the world. And it's not because he grew up in a home of Ovdei Avodah and decided to make his own path. And it's not because Avraham Avinu accomplished so many great things and went through all the Asara Nisyonos. And it's not because he was willing to even sacrifice his son. All of that is tremendous. All of that has unbelievable merit and great value. But says the Chassam Sofer, that is not what makes you most beloved to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. What made Avraham Avinu most beloved is because Avraham Avinu understood that he had a responsibility to the human beings who lived in his generation. Avraham Avinu, as we know, they took time to pay attention to the human beings that lived in their generation. 
Avram Avinu made sure that everyone was welcome in his tent, Jew and non-Jew alike. Avram Avinu showed how much love we need to show to other human beings, to all of humanity. We all have a shared experience of humanity, and we need to do whatever we can to show that we actually care. Why? Because if you love HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and you understand that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is really the one who created this world, then by extension you need to love everything that is connected to him as well. And human beings are created B'Tselem Elohim. And therefore the Navi Yeshaya writes, God himself refers to Avram Avinu as Zera Avram Ohavi. Avram Avinu is my beloved, not because of all the great challenges that he overcame, but rather because Avram Avinu understood that he had a responsibility to all of humanity living in his time, and therefore he goes down for all eternity as the beloved, as the treasured child of HaKadosh Baruch Hu himself. There's an amazing comment of the Ramchal. The Ramchal is the author of the Mesila Sisharim, lived in the 1700s, one of the great Jewish philosophers whose Svarim have become a classic in anyone who cares about Jewish philosophy. We need to obviously be familiar with his Svarim. The Ramchal writes so many important values that every Jew needs to be aware of. But there's something that caught my attention a number of years ago. Maybe just personally, it was more of interest to me, but it's something that I think is extremely instructive. And it's something that has guided me. You know, in the Rabbanos, there are times that one can be very frustrated. There are times that one can feel that things are very difficult. People give you a hard time. People are very critical. People always have something to say. And sometimes it's very difficult when you're not appreciated, when you're not understood, when they don't realize how much goes into it. And sometimes it's easy to lose patience. And the question that I always had was, how do we deal with that? In positions of authority, it's not only in the Rabbanus, it's anybody who has any position of authority. How is it that you have an opportunity to serve the people who expect you to serve them and yet not to get frustrated, not to get frustrated by sometimes the response or lack of response that you might receive. And the Ramchal addresses this. And this is something that I have on my desk. It's something that I keep in my office. It's something that I keep with me at all times, because to me, it's such an instructive comment. Where the Ramchal writes in the Mesila Seshar, Ein HaKadosh Baruch Hu Ohev. Who does God love? Ein HaKadosh Baruch Hu Ohev, Ela Lemi She Ohev Es Yisrael. God only loves the person who is willing to love other Jews. And then the Ramchal goes further. V'chol Ma She Adam Magdil Ahavaso Le Yisrael. Commensurate with the amount that I am willing to show how much I love Jewish people, how much I love other human beings. You want to know how you can find favor in the eyes of God? You want to know how you can be assured that HaKadosh Baruch Hu will love you? Well, the more you love His children, the more you love His people, the more He will show His love for you. And writes the Ramchal, that is proportionate. That is corresponding to the amount of love that you show others. That is what you will get in return. The love that HaKadosh Baruch Hu will show and shower upon you. And that is a powerful statement. That is an instructive comment of the Ramchal in the 1700s, to which he goes further and says that the common denominator of every single effective Jewish leader throughout all of Jewish history always was that they had an immeasurable amount of Ahavas Yisrael, that there was no limit, that it was just inexhaustible the amount of love that they were willing to show, sometimes at a tremendous personal cost, at a tremendous personal price that they paid either to their health, to their own lives, or to so much else that they had to put up in order to show their unbelievable expression of Ahavas Yisrael. And that is an amazing comment of the Ramchal, to which he ends off the statement by saying, Imagine you have a parent. Who does the parent love more? Who does the parent appreciate more than the person who's willing to share a kind word about their child? So we all know that our children go to school, at least in normal times, our children go to school. And many teachers are extremely talented and they teach our children very effectively. And yet the teacher that really finds favor in the eyes of parents 
is the one that is willing to call at night or to send an email or to send a quick text or a picture and just share how much they appreciate our children. It's not that that teacher is a more effective communicator. It's that we love that person more because if we have children and somebody else shows their appreciation for our children, those are the people we are going to love and appreciate more than anybody else. And writes the Ramchal, that is the same way that it works with the Ribbona Shalolab himself. If we appreciate HaKadosh Baruch Hu, then it means we appreciate his children, as the Maharal writes. But says the Ramchal, it also means that the more that we appreciate his children, the more he, in return, will appreciate us. And that is the lesson of the Ramchal. If we ever feel that we are going to lose patience, like Hillel Azakin, never lost his cool, never lost his patience because he understood that life is about being an ohev es abrios. And look what you can accomplish by having patience, by having understanding of other people, by really listening to them and by really lending them an ear. What you can accomplish is, says Hillel, mekarvan la Torah. You can bring people closer just by being who you are. Hillel Omer means not that Hillel got up in his shear one day and shared this thought, but rather anyone who knew Hillel was well aware of the fact that this was the guiding principle of Hillel's life. This is the way he lived every moment of his life. This is what his life represented. All were aware of that just by taking one look at who Hillel Azakin was. So there's an amazing Gemara in Masech Sukkah. I believe it's Daf Chav Ches, Ahmed Beis, where the Gemara tells us either Ahmed Aleph, Ahmed Beis, the Gemara there writes about Shmonim Talmidim Hayulola Hillel Hazakin. The Gemara says that Hillel had 80 students, 80 prominent Talmidim. So my father always likes to say, 80 students? Really? Hillel goes down in history as one of the greatest Rosh Hashiva. He only had 80 students. Well, the answer is, my father quotes in the name of Rav Salavechik that not always does everybody who sits in a classroom have the right to call themselves a student. Hillel had 80 dedicated and devoted Talmidim who really understood his messages and who really walked away with a powerful, life-changing experience from the time that they spent with Hillel. So the Gemara tells us something very unusual about Hillel's 80 prominent Talmidim. And it says that the greatest of them was Yonas ben Uziel. Yonas ben Uziel was the greatest of all the students of Hillel Azakin, and his commentary is found in the Chumash. Targum Yonas and Ben Uziel. That's incredible. Who was the weakest of all those students? Rabbi Yochanan Ben Zakkai. Rabbi Yochanan Ben Zakkai, who later became the Nasi, he later became the leader of the Jewish community. He was the weakest of the 80 students of Hillel Hazakin. And that is astounding. And yet the Gemara then goes on to tell us something special about Rabbi Yochanan Ben Zakkai and something very special about Yonas and Ben Uziel. So let's start with the weakest of the 80 Talmidim, which by the way, the Gemara says, the top 30 on the list of 80 were on the level of Moshe Rabbeinu. The bottom 30 were on the level of Yehoshua Ben Nun. And the middle 20 were somewhere in between Moshe Rabbeinu and Yehoshua Ben Nun. So these were an amazing group of Talmidim. And yet the Gemara tells us that, let me give you a little bit of an insight into the life of Rabbi Yochanan Ben Zakkai, who was, again, the weakest of these 80 Talmidim. Well, says the Gemara, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai knew every Gemara, every Mishnah, every Pasuk, all of Tanakh. He knew every Agada. Then the Gemara says that's not enough. He also knew how to communicate with the Shadim, with the demons. He knew how to communicate with the Malachim, with the angels. He knew how to communicate with the Sichas de Kalim. It says he knew how to understand how the earth communicates with different factions, with different facets of, of creation, of nature. He knew how to communicate with the birds and with the animals. He was an unbelievable personality. That was the weakest of the students of Hillel Azakin. That was Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai. Well, says the Gemara, who was the greatest of the Talmidim? It was Yonas and Ben Uziel. Well, what is left to say about him? To which the Gemara says, he had such extreme degrees of holiness that kol of miyad nisraf. If a bird would fly in his immediate vicinity, it would get scorched, it would get burnt immediately. That is the greatest student of Hillel Hazakin. He was Yonasam and Uziel who had such extreme degrees of holiness 
that even a bird who came into his vicinity would get burnt immediately because he had a fire around him. Well, that's the end of the Gemara. And the Kutzker Rebbe, as he often does, has a penetrating question, which is so obvious, but it's so important to ask. If that was Rabbi Yochanan Medzakai, and that was Yonas ben Uziel, well then ask the Kutzker Rebbe, can you explain to me what was Hillel Hazakin? What is left to say about the teacher? Obviously, there was something unusual about Hillel Hazakin that everybody chose to go learn by him. He must have been greater than them. But what is left to say? What can possibly be greater than the description that the Gemara just gave? To which the Kutzker Rebbe writes so beautifully. The answer is that Hillel Hazakin was all of that. Hillel Hazakin also knew every Mishnah, every Gemara everything there was to know about creation. He also knew how to communicate with every facet of our environment. He also had extreme degrees of holiness, just like his Talmud, Yonas and Ben Uziel. But what was great about him was that when the birds flew in his immediate vicinity, they did not get burnt. They were not destroyed. Hillel Hazakin's greatness was that he figured out how to be a member of society. Hillel Azakin understood how to be a member of the functioning community that he was in and how to be a full participant like everybody else, and yet he lived his life with Kedusha and Tahara. The highest level is not a person who locks themselves away, who says, I'm going to live alone, and I'm going to swear to celibacy, and I'm going to promise never to talk to another human being, and I'm going to have a tiny deeper. I don't want to communicate with anybody. That is not the highest level of spirituality, writes the Kutzker. What is greater than that is the person who figures out how to be a member of society, who contributes to all that goes on in the community, who is able to be a part of everything that's going on around them, and yet to do it all with holiness and with sanctity, with Kedusha and Tahara. That, writes the Kutzker, was the incredible accomplishment of Hillel Azakin, and that is why Hillel goes down for all posterity, for all eternity, as one of the greatest Jewish leaders of all times, that is why almost every Daf and Shas discusses Hillel's ideals, Hillel's shitas, Hillel's positions on life, and everything that Hillel represented, because Hillel Hazakin was somebody who was able to transcend all that was around him, and yet he was a part of everything. Hillel understood the human beings that he interacted with. Hillel was an Ohev Shalom Verodev Shalom. In order to do that, you have to be understanding of other people. You have to really know where they're coming from. You have to go down to their level and you have to speak to them and you have to really gain an appreciation for their perspective. Hillel was able to do all of that with such dignity, with such incredible pride, and yet that is why Hillel was successful in being Mekarv on Torah. And if we were able to walk away with something from this lesson of Hillel Azakin, it should be just that. We all have the opportunity not to go out and do Kirov, which obviously is an amazing thing to be involved with. But not everybody has that capability. Not everybody knows how to teach. Not everybody knows how to inspire. Not everybody knows how to engage. However, learn one thing from this Mishnah, and that is the following. Hillel Omer. What does our essence bespeak? When people interact with us, what messages do they take away just from seeing the way that we live life? Think about the fact that Hillel's life was able to inspire other people without him having to say anything. Just by being patient, just by being understanding, just by being there for others, people were able to understand that his message in life, his mantra always was, that's what life is all about. Making a Kiddush Hashem, being that Orla Gaim, being that personality that when people look at you, they say, How blessed, how fortunate are the parents that gave birth to such a human being because their whole life is with such dignity, is with such great accomplishment. Their whole life is such an upstanding one of great principles. And those principles are such that they appreciate the entirety of of God's creation. They appreciate all of God's creation. And writes the Maharal, if you love the Ribbon Shalom, if you really appreciate what his essence is all about, don't ever forget that an extension of Avas Hashem is Ahavas Habrios. Ohevas Habrios and Makarvan La Torah, Don Lekapsachus, all of that is because if we love the Ribbon Shalom, then we love his children, then we love his sacred world, then we love his divine plan then we love and appreciate every human being. And that is what Hillel Azakin taught us. That's what every great Jewish leader has made sure to make 
a major focus of their lives, as the Ramchal writes, and that is what will make us the great teachers of Torah, the great human beings that bring honor to Torah, and the great people that will bring a more appreciative understanding to those who we interact with of what Torah lifestyle is all about and what it truly represents. Oh,